Hi guys, welcome back to Tea in the Garden, your one-stop shop for all of the cosmological gossip. Today, we are getting into talking about emotional avo avoidance. Oh my goodness, this one is for the sensitive, empathic, emotional being. So is that, if that is you, you're going to want to stick around and listen because we have a lot to share from the bottom of our hearts and we got some stories for you guys so recently as recent as this morning um i was kind of having a little bit of a tantrum and priscilla asked me <laughs> this full tea priscilla asked me something like basic about work she didn't even ask me yet she asked me and lauren and I kind of popped off. <laughs> I kind of was like, blah, 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 da, 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 right? And had some emotional volatility in my space. I have been here a couple of days. We have, have just kicked off this massive launch. And as you might imagine, a lot of stress, a lot of old pain, a lot of old karma can easily enter the space. In this time, we're also talking to a lot of people in very intimate ways. So there's a lot of excess energy and those people's karmas and energies and pain coming in naturally, empathically into our spaces. So I made a very rookie mistake of not keeping up with the basics. I know, I know if you're my student, you're, you can reprimand me for that one because I'm always harping on it. And I haven't been clearing my energy, doing my energetic hygiene like I normally do these past few days. Plus, we're coming into this launch, plus talking to all these people. And so my container was full of a lot of emotional volatility. You could have looked at me wrong and I'd snap at you, right? And I don't like being like this. I don't think any human likes feeling like that right? Like you go to the store and there's just that one Karen that you know if you like touch her, look at her, do something that she's going to like verbally attack you. That's someone who has a lot of emotional volatility energy in their mm -hmm. space. Um, so if you're listening to this podcast, you're a healer, you're an empath, you're a sense of being, and you can tend to kind of hate yourself or hate when you really feel that way, but at the same time, compulsively avoid addressing the emotion. So we wanted to start today with talking about why the heck do we do that? Why do we feel the nasty inside, know that we need to ground, meditate, clear ourselves, take some space, get into some stillness, but we don't. Why, why are we compulsively avoiding the 20 minute meditation that's going to bring us back into alignment and help empty out that full container so we have room in our life to not be an asshole, to have the higher like vibrational things that are connected to our purpose, like as simple as just being kind to strangers. So... Priscilla, yeah, I, I'd love to hear, <laughs> I, I hear you already. I'd love to hear like the Hindu Dharmic like understanding that you have of this because I feel like you have that understanding of why the heck do we avoid addressing our emotions? Yeah, I, I contemplated this so much and I know so much of our audience and community, we all relate and connect on this topic of being a highly sensitive being, an empathic being, neurodivergent, and our emotional realm is the one that in many ways defines us, right? In our human experience across the board, but especially for people like us, let's, let's be real. And one thing I'm going to say that I know is it, it, it triggers us a little bit, but it's important to acknowledge, and I'm saying it because I know it in myself, that our emotional volatility is is kind of the other side of the coin of our sensitivity 
And if we don't get a, um, a grasp on that, we could use, you know, this identity as a highly sensitive person, as an empath, as, as a neurodivergent, as different, as an excuse to harm people with our emotional behavior or even constantly make ourselves a victim. And I've seen this a lot, like, I, and I could see how easily you could go down that, that route, right? And what I've experienced through my own spiritual learning and self-development over the last 15, 20 years or so is that I think we avoid, we compulsively avoid those emotions. We don't do that one thing that we know could help help us so easily. Like you brought up, it's such a fact, like we can fall into this space when we're in our lows, when we're in our lows. And why do we avoid that thing? I think at an energetic level, it's because the emotion actually hasn't been felt. And that's why we're not doing anything like we're avoiding it because it hasn't been fully sat with. What is what do I mean by this is like, if we were feeling rage to actually let ourselves fully be full of rage, but we don't, we kind of feel it. And then we step away from it. We shove it down. We can try to mentally convince ourselves that we shouldn't be feeling rage. We say, oh, but I'm at work. I don't have time for this right now. Oh, but my kid needs me. I don't have time for this feeling right now. And it, it gets placed kind of secondarily inside our inner space. And I think when we do this, subconsciously, it's happening most of the time, right? Especially when we're really sensitive sponges, like we all are. Um, we pick up on so many emotions, like Sav, you even brought up talking to a lot of people. You could even be collecting a lot without knowing it. And we talk, we're going to be talking a lot about this in our uh, academy. We have been talking about this in our previous academies and programs before because it's so important to know. And when we collect all that data, that input, that stimulus, those energies, if we don't purely sort them out and sit with them fully, I think they just linger. Do you know what I mean? It's like a hangover that just yeah. kind of follows us. Yeah. It's like this lingering presence, <laughs> like a, like a cloud or a little ghosty that's following you around. And it's like, to the side enough that you can function, although sometimes it gets to the point where you can't, and that's usually the moment you actually do something about it, <laughs> isn't it? It's like it comes, it boils up so much that you're like, shit, I literally can't do my work calls now. I have to go meditate, or I have to go to therapy, or I have to go use my tools. And yeah, I guess my my lens would be because we haven't sat fully present with that that energy, that emotion that is the only way that they move through. That's the only way they get resolved, right? Is to actually be with them fully. Um, and so like, why do we do that? I think it's because we enjoy suffering. Ooh, love. <laughs> That's the tea. Yeah. I have, I have a perspective on this as well. So from the psychological and shamanic perspective, we live in patterns, right? We have cycles and those cycles, I've said many times, even here on the podcast, cycles repeat themselves until they're resolved. So oftentimes people that are stuck in this current pattern of avoidance of emotions have had a lifetime pattern of that oftentimes with some trauma involved, especially if you're a highly sensitive person, we can be traumatized by things that may not traumatize other people, right? Um, sounds, textures, people, certain, certain um, environments, et cetera, right? So with this history, oftentimes, more often than not, of chaos and traumatic experience, it becomes the only thing the mind knows and we become incredibly comfortable in the suffering because we know that. 
We know that. And when we start to get these new practices, it's almost as if the brain fights you Mm -hmm. into sticking with what you know, which is oftentimes the chaos. And that's where we have to, Mm -hmm. you know, with awareness, Mm -hmm. start to, you know, take certain measures to begin to disrupt those patterns to make it easier for us to actually do the practices, the tools before the bridge is burning when we first see that little spark, you know. I had to put myself in timeout this morning. I was like, you're done. (laughs) You're done. No, I mean, literally, like, we, we, we have significantly more attachment to anything that we, that is known to us. That's just reality, because anything that is new or hasn't yet been experienced cannot have an attachment because it hasn't been experienced yet. So it's like, we're naturally going to go toward whatever it is, whatever that thing is, that is the known response, right? Or the known behavior or the known person. And we do have to kind of hijack our own patterns, right? Like you were articulating to be able to do that. And I, what, what I'm also kind of connecting right now in this is, the concept of giving ourselves space. So I think that that's a big part of this equation is that we have never learned how to provide space for ourselves. And emotions are processed with space, not actually just with time. Time doesn't necessarily do anything by itself. You need space to process, right? Like like Lauren, you're bringing up when you're constantly in a triggering environment or a, tr- or a traumatizing environment, you actually never get the space to process anything. And so only when you have safety, and AKA space given to yourself, you could begin to unpack. And even then you've never known what it's like to provide it to yourself. And it sounds like such a weird thing because it, it's not a tangible thing, right? It's not something like we can say, here's this piece of paper, you've been given space, like it's you actually have to like make this weird internal permission switch slip to yourself, right? For allowing yourself to literally just sit, or to just cry or to just journal or talk to somebody and verbalize it, right? We all have different ways that can help us or feel good to us, right? In the moment. Mm -hmm. But even that, like, step alone can be so hard. Isn't it weird? Like, like how much we have to learn how to give ourselves permission. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. So I love this. I've been obsessed with this for a long time, this development of, like, emotional intelligence, right? EQ, emotional intelligence of understanding, like, oh, wow, first of all, I have the awareness that I'm feeling this feeling. And, you know, it's not me and I don't have to immediately react to it. Um, You know, I can give it space and witness it and figure out where it's coming from and what thoughts are linked with it. But that's like so much easier said and even understood than done when you've been putting so much momentum and habit building behind these other behaviors, these other patterns of avoidance. Mm -hmm. Right. So. I think almost the first step is that developing of emotional intelligence around your self-awareness of like, wow, I'm feeling this thing. And, and even though I'm feeling it, I don't even, I don't need to say anything right now. I don't need to do anything right now. I just need to be with myself and let myself feel this Mm -hmm. thing fully through. Mm -hmm. That's the first step. I think. Let's also pay homage to how many of us were raised by emotionally unintelligent parents and we're mm-hmm. never taught one even exactly. you're allowed to have feelings mm-hmm. right usually it's the opposite stop crying or i'll give you a reason you're to too, cry you're too, you're too much right mm-hmm. yeah yeah that too so we never get the base education or modeling of that so a lot of exactly. us are starting from ground zero in our healing journey learning you know we have that innate in t- emotional intelligence as empaths on the light side of things but then like on the darker side of things we have never even seen it in practice and growing up we were taught literally the opposite mm-hmm. shove your shit down mm-hmm. and be quiet behave you're making me angry now 
Yeah, you can't regulate your shelf and neither can I. So now I'm getting yeah. angry that you can't regulate yourself and I and As I'm becoming more <laughs> dis dysregulated. Yeah. This is yeah. a big thing for neurodivergent people as well. Just one, needing more regulation than the mm -hmm. common woman. Mm -hmm. And two, having explosive emotions or like very intensely experienced emotions. That's that sensitivity, which there's the gift side to it. But right now we're talking about the curse side of it. <laughs> um, it. All things can be alchemized, you know, like we get to come on here today, for example, and talk about shit that's, mm -hmm. that has been uncomfy as, soon as, as recently as this morning. So we're taught as we have that like neurodivergent awakening like oh my god i'm different my brain is like hyper connected this is why i'm so sensitive you know emotionally and to things in my sensory environment we start to learn how to regulate our nervous system our sensory experience our the way we socialize and communicate but I think the last thing that really truly gets addressed is learning emotional regulation. Again, maybe coming some from some place like the three of us do, this like very puritanical, you're a young girl, you need to behave like a lady, don't mm -hmm. cry, you're making mommy look bad, right? Yeah, Speak. don't be difficult, be agreeable. Mm -hmm. Right, we're like conditioned into so much agreeableness that we divorce connection to how we really yes. feel. Really yeah, we, we sacrifice self authenticity for safety, acceptance, and love. Wow. Yes. Yeah, that's in a I know oof in a nutshell. Um, it's like last night I was talking actually to my partner about this because we were in this really interesting discussion about cycles of that we go through uh, of energy, right? Female cycle is one example that is, I guess, very known. You could say the hormonal cycle of the female body, right? Is that we go through these highs and lows within a month or so, you know, a month-ish time frame. And this is a very known, repeatable data. We enter these different parts of our cycle, right? And I'm currently in my low, the lowest point of my cycle, which is the end of my luteal phase right before my period comes. That's always where it hits me the most. And what we were discussing and why I'm bringing this up now, because I think there's such an interesting connection. And I kind of have this whole new hypothesis and theory about this, that when we are having uh, an experience of a low, we could also call this these emotions that really hit us like tidal waves, right? Or emotions that mm -hmm. hijack us in a overwhelmingly life negative kind of way um when we're in that what is usually happening according to like the myers-briggs objective personality model is that we go from our operation in our saviors our savior functions which are our strongest cognitive functions the ones we constantly know how to use we feel really comfortable and confident in them and we go into the ones that we call our demons the functions mm -hmm. that we don't know very well, that we struggle to use, and that usually trigger the shit out of us. So Prasida in her high while she's ovulating is at peak S-E-F-E, -E, like feeling the energy of the tribe, noticing the sensory environment, putting things, you know, collecting all this data, feeling everything around. But in her low, she's entering N-I-T-I, which is like collecting abstract information and trying to draw conclusions from it and figuring out what she thinks about things. And those are functions that are like my shadow, my demons. And so in my low energy, I go immediately into those operating patterns cognitively. And what's why I'm bringing this up though, is because what I also think is that as neurodivergent people, literally, we've talked about this in other podcasts, like our brain you could say, I, I have this visual of like the neural pathways, right? Like little highways mm -hmm. and a neurotypical might just follow a specific highway its whole life, one or two highways. But a neurodivergent person, 
diverges. It splits off into multiple zones that maybe other people don't spend as much time ever going down, if, if ever. And so what I find really fascinating about this topic of emotional avoidance or overwhelm that we could experience as a neurodivergent or highly sensitive person is that when we enter these triggers, we're forced to develop our demons, AKA our brain is becoming more diverse. I love that. Our cognitive yeah. functions are developing at a younger age in realms that other people's don't because we're getting triggered all the time. So it's like the quintessential example of the gift and the curse, you know, <laughs> like existing simultaneously. Anywho, that's where my ADHD just went, like putting that together right now. <laughs> that's so good. I love that. I want to say also like quick pro tip. You know, I like to give quick pro tips. Uh, I know when I'm avoiding a feeling something like I'm in that compulsive emotional avoidance when I'm playing stories mm. having thoughts in my mind that are very victim-y yes so I'm not I'm not into that I I don't my whole thing is like empowerment empowerment like that's my mm. my gift and my calling is to empower people um, so when I, I like can, I'm at the point in my healing and emotional intelligence development where I can, I can notice like, wow, Sav, that's a really victim thought. What are you getting from that? Is the question mm -hmm. I asked. Why, why are you liking that right now? That's why I really mm -hmm. love, we love to suffer. Like, what are you <laughs> getting? From that? Um, and I want to share like a quick anecdote. We are, as I've mentioned in a big launch right now, and this is the first time that we have the three of us. We launched our apprenticeship a year ago. We've just graduated, but we're launching something. The biggest thing the three of us have ever launched, and this is the first time that we're doing it together. And I kind of have some old past launch trauma mm -hmm. that is like, hey, <laughs> hey, you never felt me back then. I'm here again now. I'm gonna, I'm, you're going to have to address this now. And because we're in a launch, we've got a lot of work to do, right? We all do. And so I'm like, mm, I'll do it this weekend is what I told myself on Monday. I was like, this coming weekend, you know, maybe I'll I'll have a little magic mushy moment and I'll, I'll deal with it then. And last night and this morning, it was like, nope, you're going to deal with it now. You're going to do it. Mm -hmm. You can't put it on the shelf anymore. I'm here. So even though like opposite Priscilla, I'm actually in my follicular phase. It's springtime. I'm feeling good. I'm feeling high energy. Um, I'm still having these hard emotions. It's because of the karmic patterns from and what was familiar to me in the past. Mm. From right, from that experience. When, when we've been launching before, right? Well, when mm. it was just me, or it was just me and Lauren. Yeah. And previous to my Saturn return hitting, there was so much effort and suffering and pain and anxiety and fear surrounding launch time for me, right? Mm -hmm. It's like, if I don't hit this mark, my business is going to tank. Uh, I don't know that I'll be on the streets, but I'm going to be broke. Or I'm not going to be able to pay my employees, clear mm -hmm. all that. But like this, right? Survival shit. Yeah. So such is not the case anymore, though. We talked about that at the end of our last podcast, mm -hmm. right? Like going through the same things but the karma the pain is no longer necessary because the pain isn't there anymore currently if there's pain it's from the past and that's what comes knocking at our door absolutely i've i've totally been processing that as well like that i don't know if performance anxiety is the right word but like it ties into every, I mean, things we've talked about on multiple episodes, last episodes, perfectionism, you know, eldest daughter, gifted child, like all of these impossible kind of expectations and weights and standards that we kind of put on ourselves in all of these, in the shells of all these identities. And I was, I'm feeling that come up for me even also in the light of all this and processing that old story again in a, in a, in a, in a deeper way. 
and realizing like my brain, which is, you know, I think kind of what happens, right? Our brain kind of scrambles to find something wrong, <laughs> you know, like we, especially when it's like really nothing's wrong and everything is really calm somewhere deep down. It's like, not okay, but there's gotta be something. <laughs> The shoe is going to drop. Yeah. Yeah. But like, yeah. there's a security that we get out of that. Yes. From the past. Yes, the, the irony. The irony is we get security from the insecurity because it, because Ooh. it's what we know and the way what was predictable. And it's like, I think the work we do, right? The, the shadow work we do personally, I know all three of us intensely every week of our lives <laughs> mm -hmm. because we're crazy. Um, but also what we teach, we, we get to teach in our academy, which is so amazing and exciting. And I love getting to witness that part of it. It's probably my favorite part actually of like the work that we do. I love the educational curriculum, but the actual, you know, transformation that happens is like, what I live for. Right. And yeah. sitting with that, I think the, the true work is like sitting in this and realizing light bulb, I don't want to suffer anymore, actually. And what does that look like? Ooh, like, what would that look like to not have to create the same story <laughs> again mm -hmm. for the 1000th time in my life? And can I, can I raise myself to that? Can I do that for myself? Can I show up like that for myself? I think it has so much to do with building up our, our, the value, you know, what we hold for ourselves truly. Like in my experience, I think so much of the work had to do with like really building up the value I understood around my, my self identity, you know, mm -hmm. like that I was worth that you know, worthy of that, worthy of that presence and time, worthy of love outside of performance, worthy of not having to be in cycles of suffering anymore, you know, all of that, right? And and getting to, to own that and practice it continuously, which it is, right? Such a practice. Hmm. You know, I would yeah. love for you guys to touch on, um, I would love for you guys to touch on in National Intuitive Academy, the specific angles that I know you, there's a lot of touch points on within the shamanic path, as well as within energy work, empath development, occult studies um, with you two that focuses in how to keep up this hygiene, how to, how to exist as <laughs> a person like we are describing, right? And and not only that, how to hold even greater space for others in the process, mm -hmm. right? Like what angles do you guys, you know, enter into like what do you touch on, I guess, is 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 my question, what I would like everybody to hear about. Right. What I know, um, I won't speak on Sav's part of it, but I know like Sav teaches and preaches and practices energy hygiene. And I do a different version of that. It's like a mental hygiene. A lot of people know mm -hmm. it as shadow work. Um, but shadow work is a lifetime process and it's, and it's ongoing, right? And it has different methods and tools and practices. So um, I really dig into that aspect of facing the emotional avoidance and raising the emotional... Uh, intelligence as well as our resiliency in being able to handle high stress and or triggering situations because it's going to happen in life. So, I mean, we do Reiki, we do the Mune Ki, but in that, on top of that, with that, the deeper integration of that is the shadow work and understanding like this isn't just a physical thing. This isn't just a mental thing. This isn't just an energetic thing. It's all of it. It's all of it. And yes. by addressing all of it, mind, body, spirit, from these different perspectives, we're able to go deeper than you would on your own um, or 
just doing one thing like talk therapy or somatic right. healing or, um, you know, manifesting or healing. Purpose. Yes. We combine all of them together to help arm you mentally with what you need to know how to deconstruct those things that aren't serving you as well as providing the education on, Hey, this is, this is what you can try. These are the tools that you can use. These are the methods that you can practice daily to get out ahead of this old pattern and this old way of being so that you can step into something new. So, um, mm -hmm. I train my students. I liken it to like those triggering moments or like the game day and you need to go to practice every day. Those are your daily practices that help you get out ahead of it, that help prime you, prep you and release those old methods of coping which are oftentimes avoidance or lashing out or, you know, responding in a way that we don't want anymore. So we do those practices every day so that on game day, we can use those tools with confidence, with some experience behind us. And, you know, and we try again and again, there's multiple games, there's your whole life, there's going to be things that come up. So I love the get out of it, get out ahead of it tools, as well as the in the moment tools that you can use on game day. I love that. Lauren, my favorite game day tool that you have is Stia. Can you tell us about Stia? It's S-T-E-A, right? Yes. So Stia represents the what happens as human beings as we're living our life. So a stimulus happens, S outside of us. This could be a thought that we have, an intrusive thought that we have, a repetitive pattern thought that we have, or somebody doing something outside of us. Somebody's real annoying. There's a Karen. Somebody's being a, a, a super dick, whatever. But there's a stimulus. So it can be inside of us or outside of us. And then we have a thought. We have a thought. And that thought is often outside of our control. It's often something that is programmed that we've learned um, or that we've seen multiple times or that we've thought before, right? And then, so that's the T, S-T-E. Then an emotion is followed by that thought. Emotions are energy and motion. They are chemical reactions or responses that are felt as sensations in our body as a reaction to the thoughts that we are having, to the stimulus that we're experiencing, from emotions, we're emotional beings. We are, especially as empaths, but just in general, as a species, as animal beings, human beings, we are emotionally driven. So from the stimulus, we have a thought. That thought creates an emotion that we feel. And then that feeling, that emotion drives our action or our inaction. So this is happening all the time, whether you're aware of it or not. Once you become aware of it, though, you can start creating the gap. And that's why we do the get out ahead of it tools, right? So that in that game day, we know that there's a gap that we can, we can create between either the stimulus and the thought or the thought and the emotion, right? But we have to cultivate that awareness, that self-awareness to realize, oh, I'm having a reaction to this um, and, and I need to slow down. I need to create a gap between the stimulus and thought or this thought and this emotion, once we do that, once we create the awareness of Stia and we see, wow, there's a stimulus that's happening. I'm having an emotion that I really am not enjoying feeling and I'm, it's making me want to do something or not do something. Mm -hmm. So the different types of tools that we've, we've taught together and separately, you know, our breath, mindfulness, affirmations, as well as other tools, ancient and more modern practical tools that we can use to help shift and to help with practice create more and more of a gap in between the stimulus and the thought. And when you no longer become um, emotionally reactive to things within or outside of you, you become bulletproof. You can't be manipulated. You can't be um, strung along. You can't be um, you know, coerced into things. And this is happening every day. For example, social media is fantasy based, right? It, it goes off the preface of what is posted as real. This is reality. This is everybody's life, but that's not true, right? It's the highlights. It's the best parts of people. But oftentimes this for people who are neurodivergent makes us feel less than or, 
or like we're behind or we're missing out on something. And the news is fear-based, right? Media um, is fear-based, constantly telling us who we need to hate, who's ruining it for us, what we need to be afraid of, what's going to kill us next, and who's responsible for it. These are all ways that hijack our nervous system, hijack our brain, and hijack our emotionally centered being to then do what they want us to do. So the next thing that happens, you watch the news and it tells you the next thing that's going to kill you. And then it gives you a commercial for burgers, right? <laughs> it, emo it, it emotionally stimulates you. You're feeling a feeling mm -hmm. that doesn't feel good. Now here's something that can soothe you. Mm -hmm. This is going to make you feel better. Or, hey, here's this new line of injectables. No hate for anybody that does that. You're beautiful, however you want to look. But especially as women, we've been influenced about the way our body needs to look, the way we need to behave, um, what our face needs to look like, how we should age. Um, and this is all put in, in social media and, and media in general. And so it's all used to hijack us and influence us. Um, but this is also going on just day to day. We're losing control of our, our energy, our happiness, and we're stepping into suffering again and again, just because we're unaware that this process is happening of Stia. So, you know what? It's really I love, powerful. I love that you, you were talking about those aspects of kind of the manipulation happening, because that was one of my biggest motivating factors. And maybe this will also like hit for somebody else listening. One of my biggest motivating factors for kind of gaining empowerment over my emotions and alchemizing my emotions was the fact that my stubborn ass didn't want to be manipulated. <laughs> I was like, I don't want to be out of the driver's seat. I don't want someone else to be in the driver's seat. I don't want something else to be in the driver's seat. And I also don't want an emotional hijacking to be in the driver's seat either, actually. I can hold the space of my emotion, respect it and honor it, and also say, like, I don't want you in the driver's seat. There's a larger part of me, my spirit, my consciousness, that is much beyond whatever this feeling is right now, that I know, that I'm familiar with, that I feel, and I want that to be the pilot, right? And that was, like, my stubborn, like, vendetta, <laughs> that got me to really do that work, you know? Wow. So we've gone from compulsive emotional avoidance all the way to like owning our emotions and having that authority over that very easily controllable, manipulatable part of our being. Mm -hmm. That takes a lot of courage. It takes a lot of practice. It's a lifetime practice, right? I've been practicing 10 years and I still... I've had my two day slip up. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I really want to tell the people who are listening, you have to give yourself the most amount of grace with this. And at the same time, the most amount of discipline. Discipline yes. is a word neurodivergence tend to have a difficult time with. The connotation of it is very uh, pain inducing, if you will. But the way that I understand the word discipline is. It, when you are disciplined or something, you are a disciple of it. Mm. You philosophically agree with it and follow it. So I like that. philosophically, we can decide I am the owner of my emotions. Mm -hmm. I'm the owner. I am the landlord. <laughs> Get off my lawn. Mm -hmm. For me, discipline, the way I had to change my view of discipline. I had to completely change my beliefs about discipline because before that I come from a very religious home who used corporal punishment and abuse to and fear to control. Um, and then I went into the military, which was another whole other extreme form of discipline. And so when I got out, I was, and being, you know, neurodivergent, autistic, ADHD, highly sensitive person, um, I avoided that as much as I could in the beginning. And what I realized was self-discipline is the ultimate form of self-love. Mm -hmm. So if you have a hard time using the word discipline, use self-love, radical self-love. It's not just going and having a facial or going and get a mani-pedi or going, you know, that's not self-love. That is capitalism self-love. Real, 
Real self-love is loving yourself enough to make sure that you go to bed on time, that you drink water, that you eat your greens, that you have time with family, that you accomplish your goals. That doesn't mean things are easy. doesn't mean things are terrible either. It just means you're loving yourself and holding space for yourself and holding yourself accountable and with grace, with love, with understanding and empathy. When we associate discipline, we're associating it with the toxic masculine and feminine versions. Yes. But when we it's really like, look at what discipline is, it's love. It's like now I have an, a, an idea for a whole nother episode that we have to do on the topic of love, actually, because I think inherently so many of our cognitions are broken because our very definitions are broken. Like what mm-hmm. is love actually? Like Ooh. love is not just soft. Love is fierce. Mm-hmm. And we don't, we don't talk about that. <laughs> you know, we don't cognize that a lot of times because like you said, we've seen the toxic extremes and then we create this resistance that actually causes much more self harm than, than love in the name of love. Right. So that's that makes thing we got to get wow. out. That makes me think about when I was a child receiving that corporal punishment, which if you don't know what that is, it's uh, being hit, being hit, spanked, whatever, smacked around as a child. Um, verbal, sorry, not verbal, physical contact, abuse, um, and being told that that was happening because they loved me. Mm-hmm. So we could make a whole list of words, like this is what we were taught love is. This is what we we're taught responsibility is. This is what we were taught um, discipline. consistency is, discipline is. So that's coming next. Yeah. That is language. Uh, language. It should yeah. be language episode. The power of the yeah. word. Power of the word. The word. I was I was just watching The Matrix again. It's like one of my favorite movies. Oh, so and you guys know I love referencing. You only watch like three movies. <laughs> I know. I know. Again and again. It's the autism. I love it. It's like. It's comforting to me, okay? I fell asleep watching The Matrix last night. Um, But one of the things that they talk about is like in The Matrix, right? The bots make everything. And they were talking about how do they even know like what chicken tastes like? There, that's maybe that's why chicken tastes like everything because the bots couldn't figure out how. Like, so you have to think about like your definitions of things. And that's, if y'all haven't read uh, The Four Agreements, go and read it. Uh, The fifth agreement, though, is question everything, even the things you think you know, especially the things you think you know. We, we, almost everything we know, we were told. So we don't actually know, we believe. Mm -hmm. And so in a lot of the, um, like, deconstruction process, it's going and finding out for yourself the definition of things, Mm -hmm. your own personal experience of what things are and can be versus maybe what you've experienced in the past or what you've been told in the past, because that could be total bullshit. And even your emotional conclusions. Yes. Like check those two. I was actually going to talk about this a few minutes ago and then we got another topic, but like check yourself seriously and not in, again, not in a hateful way, in a Mm -hmm. loving and very aware way realize how little you actually know and it's a it's an opening it's not a closing it's like a hey maybe there is more to this than I'm feeling or seeing maybe there's more to this person and why they're responding that way that I'm thinking or seeing the more to this situation than I'm not fully seeing it opening to that possibility checking yourself brings a lot of emotional maturity and helps a lot in the process of um, taking responsibility over the way that we can spew our own reality, emotional reality onto others versus actually just taking ownership of it, acknowledging it for ourselves, but realizing like that doesn't need to be anyone else's, right? Mm-hmm. Ex- experience or, or truth. I like to pretend this Rachel's in my head. Like, hey friend, that's a big emotion. <laughs> I was <laughs> when I'm that's like how I check myself. I that. That's a big emotion. That's Why so, do you think that's, that's so cute. That's so cute. So, I love it. This has been so amazing. Um, yeah. 
I don't think I touched on my portion of emotional regulation mastery in the National Tube Academy, but oh, confusion is the beginning of understanding. And I will also want to say, like, I mean, we've said it 10 times throughout this episode, this is a lifelong practice development. We have to have grace with ourselves, but also s- stick with it out of love. What I processed through all of this old pain in two days might have taken me two weeks or two months previously. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So you got to mark and validate yourself for every milestone that you come along. You're never going to be perfect. You're going to have your freak out moments. You're going to hit pain. You're going to hit fear. But every time through practice, you can move through it faster mm-hmm. and you can optimize it into something beautiful. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Like this part. I agree with Savannah. Like, I feel like the true, um, like proof is in the pudding is not that your life becomes perfect. That's bullshit. That's not real. Um, but the, the proof in the pudding is that you're able to transmute and move through things Mm -hmm. at lightning speed compared to where we have been, um, in the past. And it just gets better and better. The more you practice it, the the quicker the easier it gets it's it's uh very powerful stuff and honestly everything that we kind of talked about in this episode in my opinion is exactly what we equip you for inside of Mm -hmm. national intuitive academy that's the Mm -hmm. like unofficial what you learn (laughs) the official what you learn is like you get certified in reiki and yoga and Ayurvedic psychology and Tantra and tarot and astrology reading. Yes, you do. You get a ridiculous amount of knowledge, but the underlying what's really going on for you week by week, month by month is doing this work with actual structured guidance, support, and the support of mentorship and community that gives you that love and safety. The space, yeah, the space Mm -hmm. is actually set up for you. You don't have to self-create it all and burn all your energy out trying to figure everything out solo that's the whole that's the whole thing we're here for you know in that Mm -hmm. process and yeah i would love to as we conclude this episode to just share one or two minutes on what this opportunity is because it's something that we have poured everything into and that is of immense value to be honest and i say that with such sincerity because i I know it and I believe it and um, would love to hear what you guys would like to share with everybody listening to our community about what the heck this uh, academy is all about. I'm dancing because I love it so much. (laughs) (laughs) It's literally exciting. Oh my goodness. Let me just start with who this is for. If you've made it this far in the podcast, this is for you. Yeah. First, Mm -hmm. um, this is for anxious empaths, intuitively gifted beings who are called to the path of healer, but have kind of no idea, like how the heck do I even make that happen in our modern world? I don't really know a lot about business and marketing. I just know I'm gifted. I'm supposed to be developing those gifts and sharing them with people to help them on their healing journey as I help myself on my healing journey. That is who this is for. Mm -hmm. We are the three headmasters. We also have an additional dean of students and a mentor. We also have an additional 12 year three students. And the launch that we've been talking about and referring to the whole episode is for our year one program. It is comprehensive in and of itself the first year. Some, however, want to stay active in the community, want to continue niching down their education. They will continue to do two or three years. Um, But we have opened up our doors this month of July to 100 souls. We have lowered the price to a, the cost of a phone bill and added in more than we've ever given. We've combined all three of our already developed, already successful, already creating empowered healers programs into one big kahuna. 
is a lot of information, is a massive transformation, um, but we do it at a very delicious pace. And we are a community of very neurospicy people succeeding together. It's, it's a year long so that we could pace it so perfectly for you to not only absorb the information, the knowledge, the wisdom, but most importantly, the integration and the practice and doing the actual work, which let's be real, 80 to 90% of the spiritual community who sells products, services, and healing does not do. So they kind of just dump you out at the end on the They usually just dump you out at the end and, or they also have never done that themselves. I said what I said. It's true though. And we really want to do things differently (laughs) and we want you to experience it differently because that's where the beauty is. That's where the enlightenment is. That's where the empowerment is. And that's where you get to actually step into your purpose, your dharma, your community impact in this lifetime. So Holler at us. The link will be in the podcast. I'll make sure to add it in to this episode. Um, You can also DM any of us on Instagram directly with any questions that you have, any inquiries about the program. And if you are totally ready to apply and we can see if this is a right fit for you, please submit your application through our link. Yeah. And you guys have the really cool option. It, this is a kind of like a hybrid course where you can, obviously everybody's going to get the group experience, but if you want even deeper support, you can work with one of us one-on-one the entirety of the year program as mm-hmm. well to help you further integrate. So that is an option for those who are looking for even deeper support and uh, need that extra care. We have that option for you as well. That would be me. Yeah. That would be me. That would definitely, that would definitely was me. <laughs> yeah. Always selecting the the most one on one tiers available. And, and look where it got us. Question. <laughs> yeah, and look where it got us. Okay, you know what? We out here, successful. We thrive. <laughs> if if I could summarize like the vibe, we have a real life Hogwarts. It's a very sexy yeah. university. I mean, it's in the name. Gifted and magical creatures. The, the long name is Natural Intuitive Academy of Ancient Healing Sciences. Yeah. It is but Seriously, as a, as a kid, if you dream, sorry to interrupt, interrupt you. If you dreamed as a child watching Harry Potter, reading dragon books, reading fey magic, reading about mermaids, reading about whatever fantasy world, and you were like, this isn't a fantasy. Like, I know somewhere deep down, this shit ha- is real. And I feel it. I feel the magic. And I know. And I know the power. You tried to bend the elements as a kid. That, this is a school for you. We, we made the thing. We made it. <laughs> it's here. It's real. And you're going to leave with really legitimate training and certifications for the real world, too, <laughs> that, that can actually make you extremely successful in your practice. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So definitely check it out, uh, apply, and uh, yeah, we can't wait to work with you for those who are are ready to step into their calling. Thank you guys so much for listening to our podcast and continuing to be with us and hold this community. We love you guys so much. Um, please like, comment, share. It's all free and it all helps get this energy and get the word out into the world so that we can create the change that we want to see. All right, you guys. Thank you guys. Goodbye, everybody. That's the tea. (laughs) Ciao. Ciao.